So in the last video, we covered what schemas are. I had you guys do an exercise where you um, drew pictures of a scientist, a doctor, a nurse, an engineer, librarian, um, to kind of get out your own schemas and think about how you view people in particular roles. So remember that a schema is this mental structure that we use to organize our information and knowledge about the world around us, about themes, subjects, people, etc. So <clears throat> This is going to impact uh, how we think about and view and have impressions of people uh, around us. And so we're going to talk uh, next about um, how our impressions of people are impacted by schemas and what that's called. Okay. It impacts uh, ourselves in terms of how we view ourselves and how we believe other people view us. It's going to impact our view of social roles. And uh, we did that exercise with what does a librarian look like to you in your schema? What does an engineer look like? And uh, these are also things like gender roles. So um, if I ask you, okay, well, if I say a stay at home parent, are you going to imagine um a, a, a woman, a mom, or you can imagine a dad, or you can imagine someone who is non-gendered, um, or you can imagine yourself. And so our schemas are going to impact uh, how we view our social roles, and that's built on our experiences in life. Um, and the way that you uh, grow and change and, and, and develop your own schemas are unique to you. So if you, for example, have a family member who is not a traditional in a traditional gender role, let's say you grew up with a, a dad who was a stay at home dad. And so when you think about stay at home parents, your schema might be different from someone who had a more traditional upbringing. Maybe they had a mom who stayed at home. And so our experiences are going to change what we expect. We also have different schemas for specific events. So, um, you know, uh, how you behave at a funeral and your expectations at a funeral versus a concert, right, um, are going to be very different and different within those specific events themselves. So, for example, um, we can break concerts up into a rock concert versus um, an instrumental concert and how you would act differently based on those different events in those different environments. Um, what do you do when you go to a restaurant and you eat a meal? That differs based on perhaps the kind of restaurant you go to, whether you go to a fast food restaurant or a fancier restaurant, or even, for example, um, a restaurant that is uh, specific to a particular culture. Um, so let's say you go to a particular restaurant to eat sushi. And so you go to this restaurant and you see particular um, utensils, you see chopsticks, you see wasabi, you see soy sauce, you see like a little dish. You know, there's a particular way to eat the things that you see in front of you. Um, and those are dictated by that culture. So um, it, typically, if we are not used to a particular type of, of restaurant or type of eating or a particular culture, we might might then look to what everybody else is doing around us, and then that can help us develop our schemas even more specifically. And that can help us grow um, and, and change our organization. Now, when we talk about this sort of automatic thinking that occurs, okay, this is when we run with the expectations that we already have based off of our experiences. Um, we talked about how we, we will apply these schemas to other people. When we apply them to groups of people, members of particular social groups, fraternities, sororities, apply it to an entire gender, entire race, entire ethnicity, we're now talking about stereotypes. So stereotypes um, is just a schema that you apply to a particular group of people. We tend to apply these rapidly and automatically when we encounter other people. And sometimes this is based off of our own experience. And sometimes this is based off of experience of, for example, family members or how you grew up. So this is going to be something that can be very, very bad because stereotypes generally lead to us having impressions about people that are actually not true. And so when, and, and these are very difficult to, to get through, and we're going to talk about stereotypes later in the semester and in a completely different chapter, but stereotypes and schemas, as you're going to notice, are very difficult to break. They're very, very pervasive and they're hard to budge because they rely so heavily on this automatic thinking. You know, um, 
this is, I'm not saying that stereotypes are a good thing or a bad thing. What I'm saying is stereotypes are a natural process in our cognitive organization. Okay. So um, we can become much more aware of how we do this just by understanding the process. So while stereotypes um, are uh, not good to have about people, we can recognize that we do this automatically. This is an absolute automatic process that's really quick um, and something that we can use controlled thinking to be better at and not stereotyping people. The why do we do this? Okay, so think back, um, you know, sort of evolutionarily speaking, why would this be important for survival? Let's say you are in a tribe and you uh, there's a there's another tribe that looks a little different from you. Maybe they're a different color, a different shade. Maybe they have different um, kind of aspects physically, and you've grouped them together as their own tribe. So maybe they're very dangerous people, and you uh, you know you look to that tribe. And you uh, automatically take anybody that looks even remotely like that particular tribe and stick them in that category as dangerous. Well, once you are out and let's say you're out hunting and you see somebody of that tribe, you are going to automatically and quickly determine that person's a threat. I'm not going to engage with them because I don't want to die. So evolutionarily speaking, it makes sense to place people in groups as maybe dangerous, not dangerous, friendly. Um, I don't want to engage with that person. Um, I don't like these people or I like these people because it allows us to very quickly determine, do you want to engage? Is it safe, et cetera? Now, of course, we tend to do this um, to groups of people, place them in groups that they don't belong to because we don't know them. And we're going to talk about how to break that later on. That's a process that it can get really dangerous in terms of putting people in categories um, because you think that person might be bad or dangerous and that person is completely harmless because they're a unique individual. So we're going to talk about that later on, but remember that it stems from this, this sort of cognitive process that we just do for evolutionary um, survival purposes. But that controlled thinking can allow us to break free from that. So why do we have schemas, right? So we already talked about this a little bit in terms of like, okay, it helps us organize our world. It helps us navigate it more quickly and be able to determine threat or not threat and am I in danger, helps us make sense of our world. And it also helps us fill in the gaps of our knowledge. So it helps us organize what we do know, figure out what we don't know. It helps us interpret new situations based off what we already know walking into the situation. Right. Um, and so these things can help us guide our our uh, behaviors very quickly. So we actually do have examples of people who are not really able to engage in automatic thinking. When you're not able to have those schemas and have those those automatic thinking processes and be able to go on autopilot, you are constantly engaged in controlled thinking. Okay, this is exhausting and it uses up all your cognitive and mental resources. We know this from a condition called Korsakoff syndrome or Korsakoff's uh, psychosis. It's, it's referred to actually by a, a complete list of names, but it's a neurological disorder that can happen. Um, it, it's basically uh, it, it stems from a, um, a B vitamin, severe B vitamin deficiency that can occur in uh, severe eating disorders and malnutrition and also can occur in severe alcoholism. So what the person does is they lose the ability uh, to create new memories or form new memories. And they also lose a lot of their old memories too. So it's actually two forms of amnesia and it's a very devastating dis disease. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's one of those things that occurs um, from um, a severe uh, uh, nutrient um, uh, deficiency. We see it in alcoholism because people with severe alcoholism tend to uh, stop eating and they just consume alcohol and so they don't get the nutrients that they need. So what ends up happening is that people with Korsakoff syndrome will lose the ability to form new memories. And so that means they must approach every single situation as if they were encountering it for the first time. They, it doesn't matter if they've even experienced it before. So every situation is new and that means that they have to uh, engage in this controlled thinking every single time they're they're living their life. So we know that 
memory guides um, sort of help us uh, figure out um, our, our uh, situation around us. These schemas help us fill in the blanks. It helps us engage in very quick processes. But people with Korsakoff syndrome, because they can't form these new memories, we learn how uh, instrumental it is to be able to engage in this uh, automatic thinking and have these schemas because individuals with Korsakoff syndrome are just so, have such an inability to function. Now, when you look at it, what is in the brain? Um, so here we have um, these uh, 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 mammillary bodies right here. And what happens is, is they degrade. And so here you can see that they have actually uh, shrunken and atrophied or, or, or sort of the tissue has died off. And, um, and that those areas are very important for us in terms of our memories, uh, in terms of being able to engage in um, uh, forming new memories, as well as um, being able to form those schemas and hold on to those. So we know what happens uh, in terms of, okay, if you have a, a, a damage to the brain, whether it's, it's atrophy or brain damage or what, you know, through trauma, whatever it might be, can be really detrimental to how you um, engage in your environment around you. So these schemas and these automatic uh, thinking, very important to us being able to, to be functional, uh, not only in society, but just in general. So these memory guides uh, that we have, which stem from um, uh, the, the schemas that, that we that we form, um, are important for us to be able to remember basic information and main information. But um, sometimes what happens is, is that these memory guides can be off and can actually contain incorrect information. So one really good example here, and this is the, uh, the link if you don't believe me, in Star Wars, everyone knows the line, Luke, I am your father. That's what Darth Vader says. Well, actually, he does not say that. He says... Um, uh, he he actually uh, if you and, and and again if you if you wanna if you if you wanna check it out for yourself, what he actually says is no, I am your father. That is what he says in the actual movie. So one really important thing to remember about memory. Now, if you haven't taken a lot of psychology classes or if you haven't taken memory and learning, if you haven't taken anything like that, this might be sort of new information to you. When you have a memory. If I say, I want you to think of your first pet, or I want you to think of a family member that you love, or I want you to think about um, your uh, the first day of school that you remember, okay? Every single time you remember something, you reconstruct it, okay? So when I talk about reconstruction, I actually mean every single time you remember an event, you put it back together. Okay. Um, and so it's not, so if you're, if you're remembering a scene in your head, it's not like a movie where the same thing gets replayed. All those networks and connections in your brain have to reconnect to form that memory again. So every time you remember something, it's a reconstruction. Every single time you engage in remembering whatever it might be, you're putting it back together again. So think of it, uh, and, and every single time you do it, you might lose a little bit of that information because you're reconstructing it, right? So think if I give you a full Lego set, and I'm like, okay, I want you to build the Millennium Falcon, since we're on Star Wars. I want you to build the spaceship, okay? And you build it. And I say, great, I'm going to take the instructions. Now, I'm going to take it apart, and I want you to rebuild it. Okay. And you're going to build it again. And it's probably going to be terrible the next time you build it, unless you have a really, really, really good memory. But then every single time you build it after that, you might miss a part here. You might miss a brick here. You might forget that part. And so if you reconstruct it 20 times, okay, um, down the line from the 20th time to the first time, it's going to look very different. And so what ends up happening is, is that every reconstruction, you're losing a little bit of something, you're, you're misremembering something, you're filling in a gap here. And so um, this a lot of times is, is it, you can kind of attribute it to taking a, 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 a photocopy of something and then copying it again and again, and then copying the copy and then copying the copy. And it starts to degrade over time. Well, we don't like gaps in our memory. So we just fill them in. This can also explain why, you know, your cousin went on that fishing trip and every single time they talk about that fish, it gets slightly bigger. 
right? Every single time. Well, that's because it's reconstructed every single time. And what happens is, is in cases of like, um, lines in a movie. Okay. These are also reconstructions. So somebody misremembered it. And then what happens? Well, next time you misremember it again, and then, and then somebody else is going to remember it incorrectly and they're going to take that information. And then it just kind of, it's like the telephone game. It gets misremembered and changed slightly every single time you try to remember it again. We've actually seen this in, in scientific studies. So there was a study done in 1999, um, by Carly, uh, and, and, and colleagues that found that, um, people tend to fill in the gaps based on what they think their memory guide or schema, uh, should be about the situation. So they gave participants a story and the story was, um, about a couple. Okay. And it was about a man and a woman and they, they put the participants in two groups. So group one read the story and the end of the story ended up that the man proposed to the woman. And then in group two, they read the same story all the way up to the end. But instead of proposing, the man raped the woman. And what happens is, is two weeks later, they wanted to know what did the people remember about stories? So they asked group one, what did you remember about the details? They asked group two, what did you remember about the details? So what group one and two both misremembered were details that were consistent with the schemas that they expected of that situation. So group one, remembered the ending of the proposal. Group two, remember the ending of the rape. But group one misremembered information like, the man wanted uh, the woman to meet his parents. Uh, they gave the man gave the woman a dozen roses. Okay, they those details actually were not in the story, but because people associate roses and meeting parents with proposals, they actually fit their schema. They misremembered that information into that story. The same thing happened with group two. So the group two who read the rape version of the story actually misremembered details that were consistent with their schema of what happens to sexual assault. So for example, they might have misremembered that the man liked to drink or that he was unpopular with women. And then that information was misremembered, but because it fit their idea of what that situation should be, that's what ended up being remembered and the gaps that were filled. Now, like I said before, these reconstructions, these memory reconstructions tend to be really consistent with our schemas and they get stronger over time. They get more resistant over time. Okay. So, uh, they also become more resistant to change. No, I remember it that way. Okay. Um, I, I, I use this example a lot with, um, with, with my, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, I thought had an amazing memory. I was like, Oh my goodness, this, you know, this woman can remember all these wonderful details of the birth of her children and, and, uh, you know, things that happened 25, 30 years ago. And so, um, it turns out though, that she, what, what was happening was, was she would just be very confident about her memories. And a lot of times those memories are actually incorrect. So she would just keep retelling the same story over and over. And then if somebody goes, Oh no, no, that's not what happened. She would be very adamant. No, that's not how I remember it. These become very resistant to change. And the memories that we sort of recreate and reconstruct over time become harder and harder to change because that's the way that we remember it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm making these videos short so that that way you guys don't get uh, inundated with too much information at once and can watch these at, at different sort of times. So I'm going to pick back up um, after uh, this video when, with um, accessibility. So uh, things about how we end up being able to access, uh, access our schemas. Um, and then we're also going to talk about priming. So we're going to get to that um, on the next video.